If you really think about that, what's the what's the population of Cal Poly Pomona? How many? Twenty-two thousand. So nine Cal Poly Pomona's. If you took the entire enrollment of this university and put one next to it, and one next to it, and another one, and you took you at nine Cal Poly, Cal Poly Pomona's, and then filled them up with brown and black and light-skinned faces of mothers, of daughters, of children. And then you put them all on a plane in a train. That's what the equation of how many people were sent out of the country last year. And by deported, that doesn't mean that they all had, that they were all undocumented. Because there's documentation of instance after instance of people who are born here being sent to places they've never been. Or people who were born here since six months, one year being sent to places they've never been. And so this question of state rights versus federal rights is wrong. It's not Arizona having a right to create a law that is against the Constitution. It's about Arizona creating a law that is against humanity. It is state rights versus human rights. We must remember that at all times, going back to Malcolm. You know that the greatest issue of our civil rights is a question of global human rights. Because it is not about us here in this nation, it's about those living in the planet as corporations go without passports to other countries. About having people having that same privilege and right to do the same, not to exploit, but to endure and defeat their families. My family came in the 1920s, and it's really simple. We came with papers, and they sprayed pesticides on us when we crossed the border because they worried about lice and the hair of those of who were brown skin. Pesticides meaning DDT, if anybody knows what that does to the body, you probably know why two of my aunts and my grandfather died of cancer having to work the mines in Arizona in the 20s and 30s. So Arizona is not something that's new to my family. <laughs> Working the mines in Colorado, and then the fields in Colorado, and then building railroads in Kansas, where my grandfather lost his brother. Going to Washington, because remember we talked about law and legality, and what is legal is not necessarily right. And when the Japanese, who owned most of the farms, and we're doing most of the field work in the 1940s and 30s in the Central Valley of Washington and employing the noise to work those fields. When they both were interned, they then created the Bracero program, which called for Mexicans to come work the positions that were now open because they had put the Japanese who owned the farms into prison. And then they asked the Chicanos from Wyoming, which is where my family lived, about five families, Gonzalez, Zaragoza, Rodriguez, and others, to come across and also work. And then they brought German prisoners of war to the States to work the field side by side with the Mexicans and the Chicanos. And then the war ended, and the Germans were offered citizenship, and our people were not because you have more of a right to be a U.S. citizen if you're a Nazi than if you do if you're brown skin. This is not new to us. Miller, here you go. What also is not new is the fact that we're still here no matter what law they create. <laughs> the point of genocide is the elimination of a people. And they are not successful because we are still here and we are still beautiful. LA City Council, proof of resiliency, endurance, and humanity. LA City Council last night voted to put a ban on any city council member to travel to Arizona on business because the city of Los Angeles says we do not want any of our money going to the state of Arizona as long as they have this law in existence. Some friends of mine took it another step further. Showed up at the federal building right next to
to the ice center and brought some chains and some tape and some locks and within a matter of minutes created a human chain around the ice center preventing any bus loaded with people to be deported from coming in or coming out and shutting down the federal building for 24 hours. The proof of how resilient and how strong and how brilliant we are comes when we think outside of the box they put us in. Both the box of our ethnicity, which is thinking this is a Mexican issue, or a Salvadoranio issue, or a Somali issue, or an Eritrean issue, or a Samoan issue, or a Cambodian issue, when it's everybody's issue. It is a human issue because it is around the issues of we have the right to feed our families and defending others' right to do the same. Um, we all come from different places and I want to just really close off with something because I really, one of my favorite part of anything is really getting into questions and answers and creating a space for people to talk when you have dialogue. And can we first actually get a round of applause for MSA for putting on this event? For creating the space for this dialogue? For people to look at each other who are sitting down and say, yo, maybe I should go talk to that person. Maybe that person needs support. And also partnering each other's resources. When we were fighting in, in Colorado for uh, Chicano Studies Department, or when we were fighting at UC Riverside for an investigation into the cover-up of rape of women and women of color on campus, because one of the biggest things universities do is tout their statistics around how low rape is in order to show how safe the campus is. And the university was deliberately publishing lower statistics in order to increase student enrollment. That when we fought for that and the chancellor shut down the funding the associated students had given us to file a legal case against the university, we began to realize that we needed to start building partnerships upon relationships and resources and ask who has access to lawyers? Who has access to legality and to legalization of immigration processes? I get calls and emails all the time from people of teachers who are like, my student's mother just got deported in a raid last night and she's seven years old and she doesn't know where to go and she's afraid to go home and we don't know where the family is and she's never been back to El Salvador and we don't know what to do. And there's a whole network of people who are doing beautiful work that they are able in instances like that and did in instances like that to find out where she was, to arrange a lawyer to visit her, to tell her not to sign any papers, to show how deporting her would create a hardship on family, beginning a legalization process, and actually getting her her citizenship papers and reuniting her with her mother, that that doesn't have to be an isolated incident, nor should it ever be an isolated incident. So until we can take preventative acts that ever stop things like that from happening, the methods for stopping things like that or slowing it or putting those actions in reverse 